Friday. All right, Scott, we are live on Facebook. So welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great yeah. to be here. No, I think I appreciate you carving out uh, carving out some time. We're on opposite coasts uh, of the country here, so it's it's not always the easiest to to coordinate. So I uh, I appreciate you taking the time to do it. Of course. Awesome. Well, I'm I'm going to uh, share this video to a couple of places real quick. And folks, if you're watching the stream, uh, make sure you hit the like button, hit the uh, the little love icon, the wow face, whatever um, icon you can. That really helps us get it in front of more people and uh and get this um this live video out there for the world to see um and uh that that'll help a lot uh well scott what what uh what does the um the daily rigors of of life look like for you at the current moment are you spending most of your time doing formula e stuff or um msf uh, a lot of msf um a lot of um i have a um i run a little guitar repair shop uh when i'm at home i have a little oh, that's shop right here. Yeah, and so I've been quite busy with that. Uh, a lot of people have been picking up the hobby, either starting a new or, or picking it up from before uh, playing guitar. And so that's been keeping me really busy because we we um, we finished up the Formula E season in August with uh, we did six races in nine days at one facility with three different track layouts. Um, and so we kind of just came in and knocked everything out all at once there. And we're supposed to start back up again. We've got a test scheduled for the end of November, um, but. Until then, I'm kind of, I'm kind of just, uh, I've become a homebody, which is weird after traveling 400,000 <laughs> miles every year for 25 years, you know? So yeah, it's kind I, of strange. I, bet. I think there's a lot of people in the motorsports world that have probably felt that this year going, this is the most time I've spent at home yeah. in a long yeah. time. Yeah, my wife and I've been married 10 years. And uh, I think, I think it was, uh, I, I stopped traveling March 12th. And I think it wasn't, it wasn't like, April 15th or something like that, where she was like, you've never been home four weeks in a row. So in 10 <laughs> years. So it was a, uh, it's quite a change, but I don't know. I, I had, I kind of, I kind of like it. Yeah. It, it, it's a different, um, I, I had this very similar experience, you know, it's, it's a different, uh, it's a different animal, but um, I just, my wife and I just bought a new house and I now have a, uh, a man cave as she calls it. Right. But ah, uh, I've, I've been, playing instruments I, I wouldn't call myself a musician i've been playing guitar and bass guitar since i was in high school and uh i've been meaning to pick your brain about about that i need to get a, a bridge setup done on a stratocaster and I, i'm in the market for a new bass guitar uh at the moment so um that's that's definitely. two things that's two things you and i have in common so that's no right problem. it'd be interesting i bet we could start a facebook group for uh guitar players and uh and racers and it would probably be pretty popular i bet i bet it would be Awesome. Well, I, I think the, my, my primary interest, especially after, um, you know, Eric cluing me into your background with Pi uh, data systems, but a lot of my interest in, in having you on the Apex Pro Show was to learn about kind of the history of data because you were kind of foundational in bringing um, these Pi systems and kind of integrating it into, uh, at the time, what was Champcar, I believe, and, and other applications. But I would love to hear about your background with Pi and what that looked like. What did a, what did a data system look like? uh, in that era. And, um, it had to be, had to be pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I started, um, I started out with Pi in, in 1995, um, which doesn't sound that long ago, but Holy cow, it's a long, long time ago. <laughs> um, and, um, I actually started out my first, my first gig with them. Uh, I focused solely on go-kart market. Um, Pi had a system that was called a system one, um, was a little, a little bitty black box with uh, screw terminal connectors on it. Um, that's how you connected your sensors through screw terminals. And then it had a little, a little, a little bitty, um, you know, probably I don't, I don't have anything on my desk that's the size of it, but a little bitty dash that would go on the wheel of the, of the go-kart. Um, and it had one big red button and you'd kind of push that to page through stuff. Um, and it had, um, I believe it was a six channel logger. And so, you know, it had wheel speed, RPM, um, uh, exhaust gas, cause that's super important in karting. Um, and then you do like, you know, throttle and brake. And then the box had accelerometers built inside of it or whatever. And uh, a DOS based software, which is how old I am. So people probably don't even know what DOS is these days, but um, yeah. And it, it, that's how it started out. And then it just kind of moved from there. And, you know, back in the day, Pi used to call their systems by numbers. So there was system one, two, three, and four. 
and four was what was used in indie cars and three was kind of you know formula atlantic that type of stuff indie lights um and then two was an integrated logger that was integrated into a dash kind of like the way the motec stuff is um the logger and everything was built to the dash but yeah it was uh it was different it was interesting yeah. i mean it's it's funny i i um I was traveling to uh, Geneva to go to an FIA meeting a while back. And ironically, um, Danica Patrick was on my same flight. And um, I didn't say anything to her on the, on the plane, but um, I used to work with her and her dad um, when she was driving go-karts for Tony Kart back in the day. Oh, wow. I actually taught her sister, Brooke, how to do data analysis because she was the data engineer for the team. <laughs> and okay. so and she didn't recognize me and she's like, should I know you? I was like, well, I taught your sister how to use Pi software and she was like oh my gosh scott you know and it just it was just funny to kind of catch up and but that's the way it was back then i mean you you know the family members would do the downloads and everybody would kind of take care of it i'm i'm sure it's still the same way it's just different devices now yeah um, but yeah it was uh it was a bit rudimentary yeah then. that that's really cool i loved i love the naming convention all right we'll just mm -hmm. call it the one the one yeah, yeah. yep why not Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's that's really cool. So the the one was your karting product, and then you had the the four for the champ cars. And yep. so I guess on the at the time the champ cars um didn't have the, the dash set up. You had like a independent logger in the car, kind of a you still see some of that in, in open wheel cars, right? Yeah, no, it had it had a dash, but it was a separate dash. It wasn't on the steering wheel the way it is now. Um, it was actually very big. I mean, it was probably 10, 10 maybe eleven inches wide, um, and had two big ear switches on the top of it you'd have to reach up and switch the hit the switches and hit the pages and things like that so um it was yeah it was pretty unique i mean what's funny is there are still historic uh you know historic champ cars or indie cars whatever you'll call them lolas and and um swifts and things like that that are actually running around at historic races and there's a guy that i know in england who specializes in taking care of these old pie systems um wow. because they somebody needs to do it because that's that's how the car runs. It's still, you know, even, even back in the, you know, the early to late nineties, we still had ECU links and um, you know, it, there was no can streams back then, but it was, it was a pure ECU stream, you know, kind of like a can with two wires and you'd, you'd go through and write up a stream and pull all the data off the ECU. And I mean, it still existed. It was all, it was all there. Um, so there are guys that still need that to, to run their historic cars. So it's pretty interesting that it, wow. it's still around. Yeah. That's cool. Somebody has got to do the support when, when the car is dependent on it running, then yeah. yeah, somebody, somebody has to do it. Yeah, That's really absolutely. cool. Well, folks that are logging on to the stream, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, this stream is shared on my Facebook page, on the Apex Pro page, on the users group. So if you guys would just drop your, your questions anywhere in the comments, uh, if you guys have questions for Scott, um, we'll keep talking about his background. Um, and while we're here, I'm wearing the new Apex Pro t-shirt. So Scott, what's cool about this shirt is the logo is made up of tracks, track shapes, but oh, they're yeah, all actually that. tracks that Apex Pro users have driven on. Um, so the outline of the track is not like a stock outline. It's actually the I'm Apex Pro devices it. GPS has drawn yep. that shape and submitted it to our to our data uh, to our server. So you can submit your data to compare with other drivers. Um, so folks, if you're watching, submitting your data at least it can get you a shirt, right? It can also help you compete with other drivers and also uh, you know, spark some fun conversation about how to go faster. But um, these are 25 bucks on on the Apex Pro website, so uh, don't don't miss out on the, on the T-shirt. Um, thanks to We Don't Lift Racing for for putting these together for us. Um, so so Scott, going from Pi into um, went from karting, I guess. Did you did you get to play around with Champ cars and NASCAR and stuff like that with Pi as well? So it was funny. I I went uh, I went from karting and then I kind of moved in. I, it's funny. I kind of followed the product. So the System Two was an integrated dash and logger. And so what I did was um, at the time, like the, the Van Diemen, uh, you know, F2000 cars, um, we struck a deal with them so that every car had a system two delivered on it. And then we did the same thing with the Formula Mazda, which was the old tube frame, uh, tube frame Mazda. And so at one point there was something like four to 500 system twos in the United States because they were all delivered with these cars. So that kind of transitioned me into, into cars from karting. Um, and then that transitioned into Atlantics and, and um, <clears throat> started getting into some of the bigger systems. And then um, in 19, so I started in 95 and then in 19, I guess it was maybe 90, about the middle of 97, um, Pi decided they wanted to get into the NASCAR business. So I moved, uh, I moved down to Charlotte and um, 
worked out of my house for about a year and a half, um, just trying to go around and, and, and drum up business from the NASCAR teams. Um, and, and we did, we ended up, you know, ended up, I think we tripled or quadrupled the market and ended up opening up an office down there that had four or five support guys and, you know, created a nice business, um, for pie at the time. That's uh, awesome. You know, so, but it was cool. I mean, it was a great, it was a great experience because I got, you know, I got to be, I was down there for, you know, I think, like I said, I started going down in 97. I think I moved down there in 98, mid, no, mid 97. Yeah. And so it was kind of a cool time. It was, you know, it was right when, I mean, everybody was still there, you know, I mean, it was, mm-hmm. you know, you wow. still go to, you know, the Richard Childress shop and, you know, Earnhardt was there and you'd still see all these, you know, these big, huge names from back in the day. Um, you know, it was kind of cool and get to know all the engineers and meet all these guys. And so it was really fun. I mean, it was, it was, it was a cool part. It was a cool time to be there, you know, because they, it was still when NASCAR had no electronics on the cars and they weren't racing, you know, like they are now, like now they've got a digital dash and and a McLaren ECU. And back then they didn't have any of that stuff. So we'd go through the process of installing the systems on the cars just for the tests. And then you'd have to pull everything off um, when it came time to go racing. So um, that (laughs) was a, yeah, it was, it was crazy. I mean, if you can imagine, I mean, everybody spends so much time, you know, building your damper pots and installing your damper pots and doing all this stuff. And we had all these brackets with hose clamps that would go on the cars just so you, cause you knew you had to put it on or take it off all the time. So um, it was kind of a, it was kind of an interesting approach, you know, but it was, uh, it was, it was a good time because it was really, it was really when um, NASCAR went from being kind of, um, you know, seat of the pants engineering to real proper engineering where everybody was doing wind tunnels and started, you know, and yeah. we, we, I mean, we'd build, we built actuators that would run off of the actual data that we gathered at the racetrack from the damper pots. And so we'd go into a wind tunnel and have the car moving through, oh, wow. you know, moving through the process of, of running around the racetrack based off of that data. Um, yeah. that we'd get off the pie system. Sure that was probably, you know, around the first time that was ever done. I mean, it, it maybe at the formula one level, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, it was such a, I mean, it was such a foreign approach in NASCAR. You know, I mean, it just, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't heard of. And I mean, we started, we, we started doing it by, you know, we'd sit down with a, with an Excel sheet and plot out and export our, our damper data and find, you know, find a couple of, of locations and then still have to manually move the actuators and you'd set the car at one height and you'd do a bunch of runs and you'd set the car to a different height and do a bunch of runs. And then finally we found a, we found a software guy who could say, who was like, Oh, well, I can take all these points and make it do that. And we're like, yes, you should do that right now. Think, make that happen. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah. And so it just, uh, yeah, it got, and then, you know, once we did that, then we transferred it all to a seven poster rig and we'd start, you know, working on the compliances of the cars. And so it, it was a cool time because the engineering was really starting to ramp up um, at that period of time that I was there at Yates and, you know, we were doing a lot of different stuff with Ford. We started doing, we start, I mean, it sounds crazy now, but we started doing simulations um, back then. And they were real raw, simple simulations that, you know, again, would be like Excel based or something, something really, really rudimentary. Yeah. Um, and now you sit here and think about it. And these guys go and sit and drive around the loop simulators that are, you know, bigger than people's houses that, you know, have full screens and, you know, full, uh, full activity and, where they even have to, they have to, you know, they have to train the simulator for the driver because everybody's inner ear balance is so different. Like, you know, you and I couldn't just go jump in a drive in the loop simulator. They have to, they have to set it up for our, our own, you know, headspace to get it to work. So it's crazy where it was, and it wasn't that long ago, you know, I mean, I have gray hair now. I didn't have gray hair then, but like, it's just funny to see how that's happened over a period of 20 some odd years. Yeah. Really yeah. rapid rapid change i mean the by the time i was doing formula sae which would have been uh 2013 2014 we had access to lap sim mm-hmm. um you know the uh the stuff that claude ruel puts out and, yep. and gave access to form i mean we were running lap simulation for uh formula sae autocross car yeah. you know? yep. uh, and and that like you said 10 years prior to that would not have been um, it was that analog to digital digital transition it, yeah. that was everything seemed to happen right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's funny. You know, we, Claude, Claude started his career with us at Pi. We actually, the very first seminar he ever did, we, we paid to him to develop that, to have it specific for Pi back in the day. Um, and then he's turned it into this incredible, massive Optimum G company where there's things that they do. But I mean, I remember back in the day, you know, having the first chats with Claude about doing a seminar about how to teach people how to use data. 
<laughs> like that's crazy to me. <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. My my business partner who developed the Apex Pro grip algorithm, writes the code to the app, was pretty heavily influenced by Claude at FSA Design uh, Finals and um, won an award that was given to him for a for a design uh, for a mechanical design for actually was a headrest. It was it was how it held the driver's headrest, but we actually use it. One of our other business divisions uses it as a uh, as a forward grip for an AR-15 rifle. So it's an accessory. It's a lightweight um, carbon fiber accessory, but uh, it's just, just cool to tie in, tie in and see all that. Got, got a question uh, here from Ryan Burkert, who's Ryan always seems to, uh, to be asking good questions on, on the show, but Ryan's wondering uh, about carts um, and more of an engineering question. I love it. He's saying being the carts don't have much in the way of suspension. What different ways did you have to look at data? Um, so are you looking at lat G, long G, tire data? Were um, were the fixes in a cart more in setup or in driver input? So how did how did they figure out how to make them faster? A lot a lot of it was uh, was focused on the driver. So I mean, yeah, you're looking at long G, lat G. Um, you know, looking at brake pressures, um, steering, um, all of that. I mean, there was because the limitations of the system back then. Um, I'm sure it's completely different now with your AIM systems or whatever whatever is out there now but the limitations of you only had six channels so there wasn't a whole lot you could do so you had to pull something away if you wanted to look at something else um we did do a lot of uh we'd, we'd stack the systems up which sounds crazy but we'd stack you know two boxes on top of each other when we'd go do work for tony cart and crg and burrell and all those guys the, the carting companies so we'd actually go and just stack two or three different systems on the cart to get the data um but we would yeah i mean tire temps obviously if you can pull that off that's another that's another huge another huge thing. I mean, it's weird. I mean, people that run go-karts and I, I haven't worked in karting for a hundred years, it feels like, but I mean, there are times when, you know, and you guys can fully understand this. There are times when the cart actually being on three wheels is faster because of the solid rear axle. And mm -hmm. so it seems crazy because you're like, Oh, grip, 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 grip. But there were times where you could actually make the cart faster if you could get, get rid of that other wheel on the back. Yeah. So, you know, grip is a grip's a funny, and this is this is a much you know, bigger co conversation, but something I think about a lot. Grip is a funny thing because you want to know where the edge of it is, but it's not always advantageous to use all of it all the time. No, uh, you want to be accelerating in a forward direction as much exactly. as possible. Exactly. Uh, so it's yeah, it's yeah. a it's a it's a car control. Once you kind of supersede as a driver the ability to understand car control yep. and to keep the tire at the limit of grip. Yep. Um, you know, there's situations where that's absolutely the truth, but that's something that, that we have as a long-term goal as a business with what, what our product inherently kind of does. But, um, that, that's really interesting. So you went from the, the world of pie and, and data systems and somehow migrated into these race director roles that you're current currently holding, but you had tenure with champ car with, uh, um, IMSA and American Le Mans series. Yep. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what, you know, what the race director role is and, and what that kind of looks like? Cause I think that's really fascinating. Yeah. So, um, so the race director, it's uh, the easiest way to describe it. And this is the way I actually described it at the FIA race director seminar um, a couple of years back is that the, the race director is the chief executive of the on track activity, if that makes sense. So anything that has that, anything that happens on the track, during a session, whether it's a practice session or a qualifying or the race or whatever, the race director is the guy that's in charge of that. And the way the FIA structure is actually created is that, um, you know, whatever happens, good or bad, it's the race director's fault. Um, and so that's kind of the way it works. And that goes from everything to inspecting the track, you know, checking the barriers, looking at, uh, looking at surface conditions, you know, whether it's, uh, um, you know, what the flag conditions are. If you go red flag, that's your decision. If you, if, if something's not right in terms of the racetrack, you stop it. Um, and it applies, it applies the same all over the place, whether it's Formula E, IndyCar, you know, there's a, there's a race director in NASCAR, but they don't call him a race director. Um, there's a guy there for that as well. And, and every other, you know, series. Um, the biggest difference is like when you're a race director in the United States, typically you're making decisions on incidents as well. Whereas the worldwide, the worldwide process is that there's a board of stewards who the race director reports something to the stewards and then the stewards have the final authority. So the stewards are the police, the race director is just kind of the, the messenger. Um, but in the States, uh, a lot of times, especially, um, you know, with the series that I'm used to working with, like Road to Indy, 
Um, and, and IndyCar is a little bit different. They have stewards now, but um, it used to be, you know, the race director made that decision as well. And so he was kind of judge and jury. Um, <clears throat> so, wow. um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting role. I mean, it's, um, it's one that uh, I kind of just fell into, uh, to be honest, um, from doing a bunch of other things and then just kind of, kind of worked into it. Um, uh, you know, my, my background's very much technical um, and the race director is on the sporting side of, of motorsports, not the technical side. So uh, just something I kind of fell into. Yeah. I'm sure that I'm sure the technical background helps there though, especially the decision-making process and yeah. um, attention to detail. That's gotta be important in the race director role, you know, understanding um, all the different parties that are affected by your decisions. Cause it, the whole time you're talking about it, I'm thinking that's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And you gotta yeah. be able to put yourself in the people's shoes that your decisions impact. I would yeah. Well, it's, it helps to, um, it helps to be, um, this is a generic comment, but I mean, it helps to make common sense decisions. Um, and a lot of times the rule book allows you a little bit of flexibility to, to make a common sense decision. It's not always black and white. Um, it allows you to be a little bit, you know, subjective or objective depending on where you need to be. And so that's the part of it that I, that I really appreciate. I mean, it's, it, if, if I don't report something to the stewards in Formula E, they don't look at it. And that's me kind of utilizing my own filter to where I feel like it's a racing incident and not something that needs to be looked at or pen and penalized. So to have that ability to have that filter um, is, is really good. And, and it really helps, especially from the, the aspect of working as a race engineer and, and being kind of a technical guy, because you can kind of see, you know, you watch a replay, especially from an in-car replay or something like that. And you can kind of tell if the guy's fighting the car, or, you know, kind of seeing how, how things are going to happen. So it does, it does help a lot um, to have that technical background and understand, um, you know, what's happening. I mean, I'm, I'm the furthest thing from a race car driver, but I've done it enough to have some understanding of, of what it's about. So it, it, it all, you know, the, the more general knowledge you can have as a race director, I think the better you are. Right. Yeah. You need a, a broad base, I guess is what it sounds like. You yeah. Know, you, and, I, and I haven't had really any interactions with the race director that I can, that I can think of directly, but I've definitely had well, good. Well, good for you. That means you're, you're a good boy. That means you haven't gotten in any trouble. So well done. I, I, only one event I had to interact with the steward, but it was, uh, and they, they, they made the right decision. It was Dorsey Schrader and Brian Till. And they, uh, mm. they, they made sense. It was a very common sense situation. Uh, you know, that's, that's a whole story in of itself and probably a good lesson that I would love to have, have learned before the time, but it, yeah. Um, it's a, it's a really interesting role. So I, th I think that's really cool. I, I'd imagine there's a lot of people watching that are just wondering what it's like to be a part of the, you know, formula one weekend. Um, yeah. Worked under Charlie Whiting, who is you know, no longer with us, but uh, obviously had a long tenure and involvement with formula one. So is, is there anything from that world that you learned that you can apply to everything else that you're doing or is, is formula one kind of, you hear about it being this like traveling circus and it's, living in this kind of vacuum is that is that true um, it is to an extent but i mean what what i've what i really learned from charlie specifically i mean because he was he's the guy we all hold up as as the ultimate you know race director and so the thing that i always learned from him was that i mean even in the like like some of the ones about as high stakes as you can get right like the money that's involved and the sponsors that are involved and and the speeds and everything about it everything about formula one is just super super high stakes and the thing that was always amazing about Charlie was that he, you know, he never, he never really got worked up over stuff. He always kept a calm demeanor and that approach just allowed, um, it didn't diffuse situations because if somebody's upset and somebody's angry, they're going to be angry and upset, but it allowed him to manage the situation in a way that, that really probably uh, it, for sure, in my experience, it applies to every level of motorsport everywhere. Um, you know, it's just about how you approach it and it's about how you, and it's about how you treat people. And, you know, I've, I've, I'm sure we've all seen, you know, race officials who kind of take it a little bit and a little bit goes to their head, you know, and, and it makes it a little bit difficult. And here's a guy who's, you know, the, the number one guy in worldwide motorsport. And he's just, he's just level the whole time you know, and shows respect with everybody. And is just one of the nicest guys in the world. And, and to me, that just, it's all about being a good person. And that's what I learned that from him a lot because 
you know, getting mad doesn't do any good and getting upset doesn't do any good. And you just got to figure out a way to, to solve it. So, I mean, it's, it's really philosophical and it's, you know, it's not, there's not one specific thing like, you know, wait five seconds to call a safety card. You know, it wasn't anything like that. It was just more of a general <laughs> approach, you know, yeah. to life. Um, and that was the thing about Charlie that he, he just had it and it was amazing. And I'd never seen anybody who was able to manage it like he was. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. I, I, I've said it before. I mean, you know, you, I try to be like him every day and it sucks because I'll never get there. You know what I mean? I'll <laughs> never, ever get there. Um, so it's just a, it's that goal that you'll, you just keep, keep grabbing for that you may not get to, you know? That's pretty cool. That's, that's not what, uh, it's not what you would expect because of, like you said, the stakes. Um, but you would expect that, that person in his role to, to think highly of themselves, at least in certain situations. And that, not that's close. Cool. That's cool to, to hear that. I mean, I don't, I don't think there was, I mean, I don't, I don't think there was any ego there, which is crazy. I mean, it's, we're human beings. It's hard to not have, you know, some here and there a little bit, but it, it just didn't feel like it was there at all, which is yeah. incredible. It didn't matter if he was talking to Lewis Hamilton or, or, or me, you know, like he was the same guy. It was incredible. Hmm. That, that is, that is really cool. Being it, being able to take people that, uh, give you that those a different time as a person give you a different emotional responses and that affect your like you said your even keelness to be able to treat everybody mm -hmm. um you know with that kind of equality mindset of just that's what you have to do to be in a respected position like that to have authority and to to make sound decisions so that's that that's really cool and i'm sure that like you said that if that's something that you hold up to and, and look towards every day it's, it's amazing how much of the race director position is a human uh, is a human skill set um, yeah. versus more of the technical skill set but obviously the the detail oriented nature of the work requires that as well yeah um, but you find that so much and, and we find that uh when reviewing data you know that's what uh with drivers that either hire me to, to be uh, to be their coach or just in this format on the show when we're looking at somebody's data it's well what did this this thing that we found in your speed trace right it could be several different things let's dive into it and figure out what it is mm -hmm. what, what emotional response or what thought process caused this because uh, it's all it's all about you as a person and you have to understand a lot of what ross preaches really well exactly you have to understand yeah. the mindset yeah. yeah i mean that's that's it's funny how um you know it and ross had punched me if he was sitting here but a lot of what ross talks about feels like it's kind of fluffy you know it's like it's, come on man just tell me how to freaking hit the apex better and break later and tell me how to drive faster but that mental aspect of everything, like it's, it's everything. I mean, it's to, it's to the point of, you know, when, um, you know, I'm, I'm famous in the Formula E paddock for uh, a Friday night, staying in my hotel room and having a room service um, because the race is tomorrow. And the way Formula E runs is we do two practice sessions, a qualifying session and a race all in one day. And so it's a long day and it just wears you out and it, and it taxes you mentally you know, sitting in there and staring at the screens and doing the things you're doing. So I, I make sure I set myself up um, in a way that I'm not, you know, I'm not going to, I don't even go out to dinner. I just go to my room and chill out and try to go to bed and kind of set myself up for the next day. And it's just like that. I mean, it's no different than, you know, than all the things that Ross talks about and it's your mental state when you're driving. It's just like you said, you can look at a data trace, but you don't know exactly why the guy did it. Um, you know, you can, you can come up with some ideas and get a good feel for it. Um, but you really don't know where his head's at or where his face is until you kind of get through it and figure it out, you know? Yeah. So um, it's interesting. I've, I've learned, uh, I've learned a lot, even though I'm not a race car driver, I've learned a lot from Ross um, and the stuff that he talks about because it allows you to, to think about things in a different way. It's Absolutely. Pretty cool. He's got a great grasp of, uh, of uh, understanding your mental, your mental state. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's a really important thing to, 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 to highlight there. And it, I think, has relevance to everything that, that we've discussed is that um, setting, yourself up, setting yourself up for that, like you said, preparing the, the night before. You know, I was coaching a racer for the runoffs last week, and we talked about visualizing uh, the success that he wanted to have. Yep. And then kind of granularly walking backwards from if you want to win – visualize yourself winning and, and yep. i take it to the point the point and i don't know if i've heard ross talk about this i'm sure he has but this is what i found works for me personally as a, as a driver but in anything else in your role as a race director with goals you're trying to accomplish for msf um i find that it's it's visualize the success that you want to have 
what would that mean to you and what emotion would that make you have? And that's a good motivator because if you want to feel that you're human and you want, you want that, yeah. that feeling and you can kind of work backwards from there. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, what's the last lap of the race look like? Am I dicing with somebody? Am I not? And you can give yourself a playbook for success. Yeah. For that you have a, you have an, and I'm sure as a race director, you have so many of those little branches of, if this happens, I've got to do this. If this happens, yeah. I've got to call full course. If this happens, <laughs> I, you know. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, um, that's your head's full of, uh, you know, to be a math geek, your head's full of if then statements. It's literally what it is. And, and, you know, and you plan for it, you know, I mean, you, you do like when we, when we go to the racetrack, we do a track walk on Thursday and then I do an inspection, you know, before every session to make sure that the track is okay. And, you know, all the marshals are in place and everything's ready to go, but you start thinking about it. It's just like, it's just like, if you're a driver, like you start looking at places, you're like, Oh, okay. Turn five is a little bit of a hairpin. So I can probably pass here. Or, you know, turn seven, eight, nine, there's no way. I just need to stay single file and don't make any dumb decisions. And, you know, I, maybe I can outbreak somebody here going into this corner or whatever. It's, you know, as, as a driver, you think about that stuff. Well, as a race director, you think about the same thing. You know, it's a hairpin, so everybody's going to try to pass there. So I need to be very careful and watch what's going on there because the incidents that happen there are going to require my attention. So you look at the track in the same way, um, you know, you look at it, uh, you know, I, I watch races on 17 different cameras. I don't actually watch out the window. I, half the time I don't have windows. And so you think about, you know, um, the way I set my screen up in front of me, I've got, I've got a big video wall. It's got all these cameras on it, but I set my screen up with hotspots on it so I can go to them really quickly. So I know, you know, okay, well, if that's a, if that's a tight hairpin, there's going to be a lot of action there. So I set my screen up. So I've got a good shot of the hairpin and I can look at things, you know, if you have to do it. So, I mean, it's all, it's all mental preparation on how you think about um, stuff, but it's funny how, you know, race car drivers are trying to figure out where the passing zones are. And I'm doing the same thing because I know the passing zones are going to be where incidents are. Yeah. So it kind of goes the same way, you know? That's interesting. I, I haven't thought about it from that perspective. You're, you're going, here's where they're going to do dumb stuff. Yeah. Maybe. That, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, you know, it's, it's going to cause me a lot of, uh, that's what's going to require. Yeah. 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 Prioritizing what's going on. Well, yep. the, the, the last thing I wanted to, to bring up is your, you know, obviously your role with MSF and uh, I, t- I took MSF level two back in January and um, enjoyed the program. And uh, there's a, a local group to us, just track it. who just got yep. MSF level two certified and yep. uh, I've known them and, and worked with them, taught some data classes with them, worked with their advanced drivers. They're a great group of folks. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a little bit of MSF and certainly uh, folks, if you're, you're on the stream and you're watching, you have questions about um, the Motorsport Safety Foundation. What is MSF? If, if you're not in the loop with that, um, we'll provide you with some information on that. I'll post a couple of links to, to resources there and feel free to reach out to me if you, if you want to know more. But what does your role look like with MSF and, and what, you know, the elevator spiel for what is MSF and, and where, what's the roadmap? Yeah, so um, MF, MSF started out very differently than what it is today. Um, it, it started off with uh, Enrique Cisneros, who's a, a you know championship race car driver, raced in IMSA, raced in um, you know Pro World Challenge, um, a couple of different places, uh, Grand Am, and um, he he had a friend of his, Sean Edwards, who was a professional driver, um, and Sean would, was uh, coaching a client down in Australia, and unfortunately lost his life. And so Enrique was like, look, man, we got to fix this. This can't happen. We got to stop, you know, got to stop losing our friends. And so um, he started out with this, this idea of, of going to racetracks and trying to help racetracks fix quote unquote unsafe corners. Um, well, you know, racetracks don't admit that they have unsafe corners. So it was a little bit of a difficult process. And so the foundation ran for a couple of years. And then when I left IMSA and started my, um, my own business, um, he reached out to me and was like, Hey man, can you come and help us? Um, you know, you know, a lot of people and, um, maybe we can, maybe we can do some things together. And so I started doing that and it actually ended up turning into a huge passion project because when I was involved with IMSA or, you know, sitting on the board of ACUS or doing whatever it was I was doing, I had to be beholden to that group that I was working for. Um, I couldn't really be independent. I couldn't really, you know, look at all of these things and kind of float in between different places. Um, I had to, I had to focus on the one place I was at. So it made me really excited because I could operate as an independent entity and, and have different discussions with the guys at NASCAR or the guys at IndyCar or, or the FIA or whatever. And it allowed me to, to move in and out in, in a different space. And so what we saw was that um, in a lot of ways, we tried to do too much too soon. 
and it, it caused us to kind of and fail in a number of ways. And so what we realized was that the HPDE was the area that we could really focus on and have a huge impact because, um, you know, the racing that goes on, most, most of the racing series already are there, right? Like you look at IMSA and you look at their rule book and they've got all the FIA specifications and the SFI specifications. And, you know, they're, they're required, you know, when they go to race on a, on a racetrack and IndyCar is the same way, they, they require for the racetrack to have an FIA homologation which means it, it meets a certain safety standard. So you start looking at all these things and, and it's like, well, it, it seems pretty well covered, right? And so what we saw was that there's this whole area and whole community of non-racing that could, you know, to sound a little bit uh, bravado, it could kind of help use our help. And so that's where we focused it on. And that's how we created the certified program, which is the, you know, the HPDE instructor program that um, helps, uh, helps build a consistent, basis for all instructing, um, whether it's a, a private group um, like HOD or 10 track days, or if it's a, a nonprofit group like the BMW car club or Audi club or something like that. So um, we just wanted to start out and put, you know, we figured everybody on the same place would build consistency. And by building consistency, you integrate safety into that. And so that was kind of the, the idea behind it. And that's how, that's how we got, kind of got to where we are today. And, and we've got Eric Meyer, who you're, you're, Facebook fans are fully familiar with in terms of that. Eric's Eric's on our board of directors and Ross Bentley is as well. So uh, the three of us, um, we're, we're it, we're the foundation. And, and so we kind of manage day to day and try to work through things and, and do, uh, you know, we, number one, we're trying to provide a, a resource to the industry uh, and try to help everybody and understand um, things that change. And it's really helped us, you know, as weird as it sounds, the pandemic has really allowed us to focus on some things that we probably wouldn't have focused on before. Um, we did, you know, a number of webinars on lead follow because at some point HPDEs and some, some groups, you know, were not allowing instructors in the car because of social distancing and they had to switch to doing lead follow. So it allowed us to, to do some webinars and create some special hand signals that were consistent across the industry, um, you know, and used and, and everybody kind of came together. Guys who aren't even a part of our program, like MVP track time, those guys, gave us uh, some hand signal suggestions and we posted on our website and, you know, those resources are there. Um, it just, it just brought everybody together, you know, and that's really what we try to do is we bring everybody together. We create the community um, and just try to try to be a resource, try to try to make sure that everybody's, you know, as generic of a statement it is, we try to make sure everybody's safe and being safer as they can be. Yeah. That's really cool. I, I just posted uh, on the apex pro uh, shared link of this video, guys, if you're watching on the Apex Pro page in the comments, there's uh, some links to the MSF website, motorsportsafetyfoundation.com. Um, talks a little bit about the about page there, which will tell you more of Scott's background and what's going on. But what's really cool is the resources page, which has, um, like Scott was just saying, the uh, standardized list of lead follow hand signals. It actually has a lead follow uh, format that you can follow for your group if your organization is trying to do lead follow. Um, and there's all sorts of other uh, resources there that you can access uh, from a variety of contributors. And it's, it's a really good way of bringing all the strengths of these different groups that, that Scott just mentioned together and, and you know, kind of promoting this, these safer ways of, of, uh, of going about events. And it's, it's, a worthy, it's a worthy thing and, and a, worthy, a worthwhile you know, organization to, to be a part of. And I've been certified since 2017, I think, was when I took my, my level one. Um, and got the level two back in, uh, in January with Chen track days at Sebring. And it's that it's, it's a great, um, you know, BMW CCA under Bill Wade, they've been doing this for a while with their instructor training program. Porsche has yep. had one MSF is <clears throat> taking elements of all of those, uh, programs and it's made it a standardized process to, um, to become an instructor and to some extent be recognized as an instructor. You, you really need your MSF level two. Uh, and it's a fantastic, uh, program that even if you're an instructor, uh, you know, certified within your organization, you have a lot of experience. This program is going to expose things to you that you probably weren't aware of that you could add to your instruction game. Uh, and I certainly learned several things from it, especially going to Sebring where I hadn't driven in a while, picked up some stuff from uh, about getting around the track, about, um, you know, the, the nuance of instructing at a track that you're not familiar with, all sorts of cool things that I picked up from being a part of that program. So it's, it's certainly uh, something that if you're watching this and have looked into it, need to consider it as part of your, part of your plan and training for instructing. Um, 
it's, yeah, it's, it's it's something that you know it it's um it's still new i mean the program's only been around for a couple of years but it's still new but it is starting you know it's interesting when i get emails from guys um because um admittedly the process for signing up for for our program is a little bit clunky um i'll, I'll admit that it's a little bit you know we're, we're not quite there yet but i get emails from guys that are saying hey man i'm getting ready to go do um you know i'm gonna go coach with xyz next weekend and they require me to have uh, my msf training and they're like you know you know in a thrash to go try and get it done before they go they go they go to do this coaching and so it's cool i mean there's a there's a database and i think um i was just updating it over the course of the weekend and i think there's you know 500 level two instructors on there and so you can pull up the database the the, the link is um on the hpde page on on msf uh, on our website but you can pull up that page and see everybody there and see what organization um certified them and so if you're struggling and looking for instructors for a weekend you can pull those guys up and granted it doesn't automatically mean that they're okay you your your own organization has your own rules and you have to follow your own your own guide right but it's a good way to start um it's a database of 500 people who at least check a box in terms of you coming to instruct with your group you know and so again that's a resource that's what we're trying to create is a resource to help to help organizations and so um you know it's um it, it happens. And, and most of the guys who are in the level two groups, I mean, we have, we have 19 different organizations who are signed up as level two now. Um, and that includes different BMW chapters and Audi chapters and Porsche chapters and things like that as a, in addition to independents like just track it and, and HOD and Chan and um, a couple of Ferrari club guys. So, but it, but it allows you to, to help find somebody, you know, in your group um, as a resource, if you, if you need extra instructors. So, and, the, and like I said, it's, it's not, it's not automatic just because somebody's level two doesn't mean, you know, it's perfect. You still need every, every organization is different, um, but it's at least a place to start. And it's a checkbox that you know is checked where this guy's at least got, uh, there's 500 guys who are trained consistently in the same methods, you know? And so that helps um, to try to create more for the, for the industry and the community. Absolutely. The consistency aspect of it is so important for, for a number of reasons, but I think safety is all about, is all about consistency. Exactly. And, like you said, at least, you know, as an organizer, when you're looking for instructors, uh, when you're going through your instructor training program and the, the recertification process as well, because there's so many instructors out there who have been doing this since HPDE became, you know, an activity. A thing, yeah. yeah. There's a there's a requisite training, um, mm-hmm. just like there should be for driving your car on the road. There sadly isn't, right? But there should be a requisite, yep. you know, retraining program because things change, nuance change. And, and, and honestly, we learn more as a young industry. We learn more about how to better serve, um, you know, our clients and how to better serve our you know, customers that are coming to these events and, and learning. Um, and I think that's something that MSF is, can ultimately be very helpful with um, is uh, introducing, helping introduce more and more new people to the sport because now they're the, this, this, this web of safety uh, consistency, but, if you're new to, you, you go to a chin event your first time, your second event with whoever, whatever other organization might also be a, an MSF or should also be an MSF certified organization. There's certain things you're going to see that are consistent, that are going to feel right. comfortable for, for you, right? And exactly. Make for, so I think it helps on so many levels. It helps with instructors, but it also helps bring in new people to your organizations. And when those new people get there and show up and participate, it's going to keep them uh, comfortable and involved and, provide that, you know, really make this a, uh, this industry, not something that your wife, husband, whoever, girlfriend says, Oh no, that he's crazy. He goes out and races cars, drives his car fast. Right. It's like, yeah, there's this, this safety body that, that is there to make sure that there's minimum standards that are consistent across the industry. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those deals where we're not there yet, but like, um, if you wanted to go, you know, if you wanted to go to the Exumas and go diving and go scuba diving, um, chances are you'd go find somebody that, you know, is a, is PADI certified PADI, which is the scuba diving licensing program. Right. Um, if you've got two guys, one's PADI certified, one's not, chances are you're probably going to go with the guy that's certified instead of, you know, uh, Joe Schmo's diving company. And yeah. so it, we're not there yet, but at some point it's going to be a differentiator. Uh, among the industry, just like you said, you know, you go to one group and, and, you know, and it's, and it's, um, we reference it as kind of a, and this is a bit old school to say this, but it's kind of like a good housekeeping seal. 
where, you know, someone's looked at this, someone's said that these guys are applying a, a minimum set of standards to what they're doing. And that's always been kind of the target, you know, I mean, the level two stuff, it's funny. Um, there's still a lot of confusion. We don't actually teach level two. MSF doesn't teach anything when it comes to level two. The organizer does that. What we do is we sign off on what the organizer teaches the instructor so that it is consistent. And there is a minimum amount of time that's spent um, doing mentoring and doing drives with the instructors and making sure that they're, you know, they're meeting these standards. So um, that's what it's about is we're setting a standard and these people are achieving that standard. Um, it's not that we're actually going out and teaching people to do anything. That's, that's not our job. It's up to the organization to say whether their instructor is approved as an instructor or not. You know? Yeah. That, that's pretty cool. And, and I like that you brought up the fact that you hear from people that have to get their MSF level two done so that they can attend or instruct an event because a huge, huge part of any certification is just putting in the effort, uh, take the content out of it, take it's if you, if this is something that you care about and, and, um, and want to be safe doing it, right. And, and participate with it. There's a, there's an element of let's put in the effort. And this says that you put in the effort yep. and that in of itself, there might be an instructor out there who's, puts in tons of, uh, of hours and really understands the craft. But if they, if they don't take the time to put in the effort and go do the MSF training, what does that say about them as a, as an instructor or as a person? And that's, that's an important element of it to consider as well. Um, if, yeah, you always, I mean, if, you know, if I think a lot of us are the same where you just always want to be improving. And so even, you know, even I like to think, and it's probably a, a little bit of an arrogant statement, but I like to think that if even if you've been, you know, instructing for 20 years and you go through our course, you're, there's still something you might learn, you know, it, it might refresh something or, or, or bring some things back. And that, that's kind of the hope is that, you know, you're always improving and always doing continuous education. And that, that's, that's really what a lot of it is, you know? Yeah. I got exposure and I'll, we'll wrap it up here in just a second, but I got, got some exposure to a, a, a Chen instructor who's really experienced in car instructor. And most, most of my instruction is uh, pro coaching, looking at data, video, um, talking about mental stuff, um, you know, prepping, setting data laps, getting in the car with somebody and having this retraining of how to really be an impactful in-car instructor was something that, that really helped me a lot uh, because I tend to get, it's so easy to get behind when you're instructing someone in the car and you really need to stay oh, yeah. Yeah, ahead. with them for what's coming up, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tr it's a tricky thing. I mean, coaching from the right seat's a tricky thing, to be honest. I mean, it's not it's not something to be looked at lightly. I mean, because you're exactly right. It's so easy to get behind, and it's um it's hard to not, you know, it's hard to not talk about every you know you miss the apex level back there. Like it's hard to not talk about that for the next two corners, right? Like it's really a tough thing to do to to know how to how to manage your time and how to hold things back and. It's yeah. not easy. <clears throat> and, and again, being sensitive to uh, the person in the left seat's emotional state and being okay. having the, those soft skills of understanding, I might not need to say anything right now, or yeah. maybe I really, they need to hear my voice for comfort right now. And exactly. understanding those, those elements of it are extremely important. And part of the mentoring program is going to give you exposure to people who have been doing this probably longer than you have and have seen yeah. more and experienced more. And also, have a standard that they have to teach. So they have to put in the effort to really be able to communicate that to you. There, there, there's just a lot of value in it. Uh, you know, it's, put it frankly. It, it's my favorite part of the curriculum. Um, the, the, is that doing the mentoring and doing the mentor rides. Like it's, it's one of my favorite things. Cause I've, it's the one thing that I can really um, participate in, in terms of some of the, I've done it with some of the groups that we, that we work with where, you know, I'm the, I drive the car and I'm the fast, timid driver, or I'm the, you know, uh, hyper aggressive, slow driver, you know, and you, you play these roles and create these different models and give the exposure to, to people about, I mean, and it helps you, you know, it's so experiential to be able to have, to be able to be with that particular type of client or, you know, or, or, or customer. Um, Cause they exist everywhere. I mean, it's just that everybody's different. And that's a beautiful part about human beings and we're all different people. And, you know, we do different things, but to have the experience to, to go through that process and, and have the experience of being with a, a fast, timid or a, you know, whatever. And, and um, it just really sets you up to when you do have that person in the car with you, it, it sets you up to really know what to do and really how to manage it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really strong part. Yeah. You get the extremes of either end and you, you can assimilate what's in the middle because most 90% of your drivers yeah. are going to 
somewhere in the middle. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's like you said, you've got to have soft skills to be able to manage that. And it's, um, it's a pretty amazing thing that all the instructors and all the coaches do across the community. When, when you really think about it, I mean, you know, most of these guys are doing it for free lunch and, a, you know, a little bit of free track time. And so the fact that they're out there willing to share their knowledge and to do that work and to spend their time um, helping someone else become part of this community and, and enjoy this sport. Um, that's pretty cool. I mean, you're, you're, you're actually giving up a lot to, to be one of those guys. And so, um, it's, a it's, it's a, it's a respected situation in terms of what these guys are doing for sure. Absolutely. Well, folks, if, if you're watching and this is the first you're learning about MSF or you, uh, you need to figure out where to go get certified. Um, I posted links on the apex pro page. I'll probably make some posts about that in the coming days. So you guys can find an event near you where you can get your MSF level two certification. Uh, for all the reasons that, that we just went into. Uh, and, and ultimately, um, the benefit of being an Apex Pro follower and user is that you're going to understand a little bit more about data, and that's going to be a really critical part uh, of your instruction moving forward as well, is to be able to help uh, people understand not only what are they looking at in their data, but being able to coach a driver and understand the, the mental, what you can draw out of, out of, out of that objective information there. So I, Scott, I really appreciate that cool kind of, um, we started with data, we made our way through our race director uh, role and, and somehow ended up kind of back to this uh, uh, motorsport safety data related uh, kind of area. But I, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. I know it's a little bit more in the middle of your, of your day out West, but- uh, Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Well, it was, on the East Coast, appreciate I, it. Was, uh, I was very excited. I am, uh, I won't say I'm an avid watcher, um, but I definitely lurk a lot and, and I catch a lot of the uh, lives that you guys do. And I, I watch them after the fact, but um, I enjoy what you do. And I think it's amazing that you, you go to this format and, and are able to share stuff with people. So when you sent me the email, I was super stoked. I was like, yeah, absolutely. Like, <laughs> yes, I want to do this. So um, awesome. I, hope, I hope it's been fun. And I hope it's been good. So, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for everybody for, for commenting and, and chatting in the, uh, and communicating with us. And we'll, uh, we'll have to do it again. Uh, and uh, talk more about, um, you know, MSF, maybe the four or five, six months down the road and what, what's changed, what's new, what's, what's coming. Um, some excitement there and maybe learn more about uh, 2021, what's going on in the, in the FIA's world. <laughs> it's always yeah, cool. no, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm an open book, so we can talk about whatever you want to. It'd be, it'd be great to do it again. I, I enjoyed it very much. So awesome. thanks, man. Appreciate awesome. it. All right, Facebook. Well, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, make sure you check out your, your new Apex Pro t-shirt, limited quantities, and also MSF, Motorsport Safety Foundation. Uh, check out their programs on their website and uh, and follow along. Scott, anything you want to say about folks that might, might want to follow you or see what, what you have going on? Uh, I mean, the biggest thing is that our, our, our website's a little awkward. It's motorsport-safety.org. Um, that's, that's the biggest place that they can find. That's where the resource page is. That's where all the information is on our programs um, and everything. I don't, um, I'm not a very good social media guy. So I don't, I don't, <laughs> I, I, I was looking the other day and it was like four months between one Instagram post and the other. And I was like, wow, this is not how you generate followers. So, um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, just motorsport-safety.org is where okay. everybody can find our stuff. Motorsport-safety.org. If you look yeah, up. And if they want information, there's a, there's info emails on there um, and a contact at motorsportsafety.org. And, and all of those emails go straight to me. So if anybody wants to, to know anything or, or get in touch with me about something, they can, they can reach out that way. Yeah. Reach out to me or Apex Pro as well. And we can direct you, point you in the right direction. Uh, and, and we'll definitely uh, have Scott on again to talk about more, more MSF related stuff. So if you look up MSF certified motorsports dash, say if you, get close with seo it should help you if you can't find the website so exactly awesome all right scott i appreciate it thanks man yeah